Hello everyone, it's Elaine here, Artistic Director of Babel. Founded in 2018, Babel has a special mission. We would like to connect with different cultures through our love of choral music. In this world pandemic in 2020, many of us are stuck at home not being able to travel. However, thankful for technology, we're able to bring people closer together and connect with one another through the screens. And this is how we come up with the project Babel and Beyond. It is a three-part conversational series featuring four choral leaders from around the world. Including myself, we'll be talking about choral communities of five continents. What are the choirs like? What is the choral education in these countries? What are some of the music you like to perform? And what about the composers in your country? We're very delighted to introduce our special guest. And without further ado, this is episode one of Babel and Beyond. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us from various parts of the world. Uh, before we start off, I just want to acknowledge that amongst the five of us here, we actually speak a total of maybe eight languages and some overlapping. Uh, today's session will be conducted in English since it is the language we all share and of course in addition to music as well. Uh, but I want to thank you in advance for your preparation of this discussion, especially considering English might be your second or even third language. Um, I thought we'll start off today with an introduction of all our guests. Um, we very quickly, while we have it on the screen here, we have uh, Leon on my left, Lucien on my right, Yelena and Anna. And I thought we'll just give a few minutes to get to know each of our wonderful special guests um, and let them tell us a little bit about their choral community and the choirs they conduct. We're going to start off first with Yelena. So, hi, Yelena. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here with us. So I actually met Yelena um, about a decade ago at the University of Toronto. Uh, Yelena was originally from Serbia and she spent a, a big chunk of her life in Canada and later on went to Spain, taught in Mexico, and she's now in Iceland. Um, Yelena is a singer songwriter, uh, both in jazz and classical and pop singing, and also an avid choral singer and a choral conductor. So Yelena, can you tell us a little bit about the group that you direct in Iceland and also the choral community in general in Iceland? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's quite a rich choral tradition in Iceland in general. Uh, I would say it's, it's probably due to the fact that there wasn't so much instrumental music here for hundreds of years. That wasn't a very developed tradition. So instead there was a lot of vocal music. It's kind of the oldest musical tradition in Iceland. And nowadays there are tons of choirs here. Um, there are community choirs, church choirs, school choirs, workplace choirs, any sort of community you can think of, there's probably one with a choir somewhere in Iceland. And it's a very, very social thing for Icelanders as well. Um, there's a really strong music education in general in the country as well with subsidized music schools. So I think that helps also build up a musical tradition. Uh, but choirs are a really big musical and social aspect of, of life in Iceland. Uh, the group that I conduct, it's a fairly unique group. It's called Kleður, which means murmur in Icelandic. Uh, it's quite a young group uh, age-wise, maybe around 30 to 40 singers. It sort of fluctuates as many choirs do. Uh, and I would say the average age is maybe around 30, in the, in the 30s, perhaps, mm -hmm. but we range in age from younger than that and slightly older. And the choir is quite unique because we only perform original music by the choir's members. So obviously many are composers, trained musicians uh, that have their own independent musical projects and then come together in this group. Others are artists and so on. Um, most of them are in some sort of artistic discipline. So along with doing original music, we also work a lot on improvisation together as a group. Uh, and that's sort of the, the main focus of the group, I would say. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Yelena. And I'm sure we'll get to know a little bit more in depth with this episode and also next episode when we talk more about the music. But we're very excited to talk to you more in this series. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. And 
next i brought to you another person that has spent some time in toronto canada and that is dr anna alvarez <laughs> um, dr alvarez and i uh, knew each other from the university of toronto she completed her doctorate um, in choral conducting at the university of toronto faculty of music a few years back now um, she was originally from colombia and now she's back in colombia as an assistant professor and has a few choirs as well so hi Anna, good to see you. Hi, good to see you. So can Thank you, tell you for us having us, me. Yeah, absolutely. Can you tell <laughs> us about your choir that you direct and also just the overall choral community in your country? Well, uh, in Colombia, the choral community is uh, small compared to other countries, but uh, it's big compared in, like if you put it in Latin America. So we are, we are very strong in a choral community if you see it as a Latin American country. Um, uh, we have several choirs. Uh, choir, like the community choir is not as strong as other places, but we are building on that. Uh, people uh, are getting more used to, to have these community choirs as, as a part of their lives. Um, but now it's mostly choirs in universities, tons of in schools, um, and then a few choral uh, community choirs or professional choirs. Mm -hmm. uh, my choir is, the name is Coron Coro. It's, the name is after a fish that is very resilient, uh, which we believe, or we want to be as resilient as the fish, as Coron Coro, uh, because the fish can live in the salty or sweet waters and everywhere and they can live even before deep without water for 24 hours so it's very mm -hmm. resilient fish so yeah we name after that because our main mission is the communities uh, we are very horizontal choir um, we believe that everybody has something to give uh, like as a singer or as a person as a human or as, as a i don't know whatever you can do uh, everybody there they can be themselves and they can feel that and feel part of a community and we are like a family basically that's and do awesome. we do contemporary music as well but yeah that's great and what is the <laughs> age group um mostly in your group or is it a big variety uh the youngest one it has 18 years old and the older one has around 30. oh wonderful uh, yeah and they are around 25 to 30 it's a small group yeah that's very exciting. Well, we look mm -hmm. forward to know more about your community and also Corn Coral. What a, what a beautiful name. It just kind of flows off the tongue. I know. And yeah, the beautiful great. thing is that Coro is choir in Spanish. Nice. So oh, Coro, and that's Coro, also nice. part of the fish, the name of that know, fish that is resilient. Perfect. <laughs> that is great. Well, thank you so much, Anna, and thank you for joining us on your busy day as well. <laughs> Awesome. Well, next up we have um, Leon Chu. And for those that have been following Babel for a while, you probably would have recognized Leon uh, in our post last year. So Babel was very, very fortunate last year uh, to visit Hong Kong and Macau and Taiwan. And of course, when we were in Hong Kong, we were hosted by the loveliest group called the CU Chorus, which um, the artistic director is Leon. Um, for those who know who might know i was originally from hong kong i came to canada as a teenager um, and after i pursued my life in choral conducting i wanted to know more a little bit about the choral community of my home country um, and leon has been a big part in teaching me and telling me and guiding me uh, a little bit about what's happening at home and the choral community at home and leon is doing some great things advocating for Hong Kong music as well. So I want to pass this on to Leon uh, and tell us a little bit about Hong Kong and also CU Chorus. Okay. Um, actually, choral music is very popular among the primary and secondary schools in Hong Kong. There are numbers of choir competitions in Hong Kong. And for the largest one, Hong Kong Schools Music Festival, there are every year there are several hundred teams participate in in the festival and 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 you can see in in those elite schools they even have several choirs to join different classes or categories in the same year 
the somehow um, the popularity of choral music is driven by the enthusiasm of competition in this city. You know, Hong Kong people love to compete with each other. Yeah, this, this competition is in our blood. You know, <laughs> yeah. I guess it's a reason why we we have world class children and youth choirs, and it's so ironic that choral singing is not a popular activity among university students. Yeah, I I am a a conductor in 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 two no 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 three university choirs and 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 every year I I I I I I have problem to to get new members. You know, maybe those experience. I sometimes I I some somehow I wonder maybe those experienced singers in those high school or primary school that they, they already burn out from competition mm, or they are only interested to to. To join those alumni choir to keep on fighting for their their alma mater in different competitions with their old comrades. I don't know, but it's it's my feeling about the the、mm -hmm. choral scene in Hong Kong. That's very interesting, and I I've noticed too because obviously Hong Kong people live a very very busy lifestyle, and you know here in Canada we have a very vibrant choral community. In fact, I think there is one choral singer in every three households, and there are actually more choral singers than hockey players、uh, in Canada.、Uh, but it's also a a lifestyle that we really value our work life balance here in Canada. Canada and from Hong Kong, I've noticed that people tend to work quite a lot and on very long hours of the day. Do you think that might have something to do with,、um, like, their lack of time in participating in community ensembles,、um, or, or that just they just didn't have enough time and and the life to to do community singing? I think that the long working hours is, is a reason why many, many people drop out from choral singers after they, they they start work, because it, it, let's say if if they can only leave their office at nine, let's say, then how can they join at any rehearsal? Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And can you tell us about a little bit more about CU Chorus? So this is the Chinese University of Hong Kong Chorus. Is that the full name? The Chinese University of Hong Kong Chorus. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, correct. It's a it's a long name, but CU Chorus in short. Um, it、Because、is the name of of, of our our matter is is long. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. And it is a student-run organization, and you、yeah. all have a very big mission, and you have a publishing line that come with CU Chorus and a CD as well. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Because yeah, we um for for us our mission is uh to bring how to say um to bring great choral music to this city. To inspire people by choral music, because because it's what we really love. Not just my love, but also all my my singers love choral music. That's why they 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 join this choir and they can tolerate my dictatorship, right? <laughs> yeah, we we love this, so we want to share it. We want we 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 want to inspire people by our singing. This is our mission.、Yeah. That's why.、Um, At first, we just sing, do performance, and later on, we we realize we realize that okay, we can we can influence more people by YouTube. Then we we have our YouTube channel, and and then we we find that oh, we have a chance to 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 make records. Then we do do that. We 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 made two CDs albums already, uh, in in this five year, and later on, we find that uh, Cantonese chorus. Cantonese is the dialect. Is the, the dialect that Hong Kong people use in、mm -hmm. our daily life, in in radio, TV broadcast, movies, and pop song? We all all in Cantonese,、uh, but but it's it's also interesting that we we have only very few um uh, uh repertoire for mixed choir in Cantonese.、Mm -hmm. We we have man 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 many Cantonese choral music for treble choir. Because you know, for for children, it's it's difficult for them to to learn an alien language, uh, 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 <laughs> other than language, their yeah. Ma, ma, yeah, mother tongue. Uh, but for 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 the youths or for the for the actors, composers are not there to 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 
to write choral music in Cantonese because Cantonese is a tonal language and they may encounter many different kinds of difficulties when they try to make the same lyrics in different voice parts while mm -hmm. the, the melodic contrary are different. It, it may mm -hmm. affect the, the, mean, the delivering of, of, of the, the, the meaning. So it, we, we have very few Cantonese music, uh, choral music. And in this about um, five to six, six years, I uh, see you course and I try to uh, commission more new words. I, I request the composer to, to write in Cantonese or, or, or ask them to arrange some uh, pre-existing uh, maybe pop song or numbers from musicals uh, in Cantonese uh, into chor chor uh, choral version. Um, and we do some concerts, we release an album and we find that if we want more people to 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 join us to 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 promote uh, Cantonese choral music, uh, we should let them to sing, and therefore we, we start our, our our publishing business uh, to yeah. to release those, those uh, Cantonese choral music. And and Yiling, you you also call it one. <laughs> Bye. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so this is a great sneak peek into our second episode because it is <laughs> it is very unique to look into Cantonese choral music and we'll definitely spend a little bit more time in our next interview to talk more in depth. Uh, but we're very excited and thank you for CU Chorus for advocating for Cantonese choral music. I We're excited to learn more about it and hoping to perform more here too. Um, so thank you, Leon. Thank you for joining us today. And last but not the least, uh, we have Lucien Mendy, who is a new friend uh, to me and to Babel. Uh, Lucien is from Senegal, and Lucien is a big advocate of choral music in his country uh, and bringing art service organization together and also have a big group. So, Lucien, tell us a little bit about your group, the Accor Joy Senegal, and also a 500 singers grand choir um, all founded and organized and directed by um, by Lucien so thank you so much for joining us today thank you so much thank you so much Ellen um, it's a pleasure for me Jack, to to be part of this uh, chat um, discussion um, yes I'm conducting uh, two choirs in Senegal uh, you have behind the choir since uh, 25 years a mixed uh, intercultural uh, chamber choir of about uh, 15 uh, amateur singers. Um, a choir is involved in peace, environment, and solidarity between people, and inspired by a Congolese uh, Cardinal uh, Emil Piayanda, who was assassinated um, uh, for his involvement in the peace process uh, initiated in his country. And uh, it's uh, composed of um, uh, adult and young singers. Um, the average age is uh, 35, you can say. And most of them are workers, and they don't read music. Um, the repertoire is um, made of uh, original pieces and own arrangements of songs from uh, Africa and uh, all around the world around themes like um, environment, peace, brotherhood, nature, or best songs of 80s, of 90s. And uh, the second choir is uh, Africio, um, since uh, 11 years. And uh, it's a secular mixed ensemble uh, created in uh, uh, thousand, uh, 2009 and uh, composed of uh, young, sing young singers. Uh, the average age is uh, 28, you can say. And most of them are students and uh, don't read music, uh, no, no, no. Uh, the repertoire is a creation. Uh, we have uh, arrangements of various work of African folklore and uh, Negro spiritual gospel, a cappella songs. And um, uh, we have two main purposes in this choir, um, rootedness, uh, just to hide like the cultural rich, rich of uh, African uh, heritage, songs heritage, through particular scenic uh, expression like uh, tales, proverbs, um, uh, dances or costumes, and uh, interculturality, uh, just to promote the Pan-African heritage, cultural heritage through singing and going uh, to meet uh, the world, uh, the world music. Um, um, we can uh, say that uh, both choirs are um, uh, involved in collaboration with uh, um, conductors, uh, major conductors, and foreign choirs too, and um, uh, um, local local artists and uh, groups of uh, 
other forms of arts like living arts like storytelling um dances the theater or slam rap and they participate at a major event here at the local uh, local level and on in festival on the international level and these squares um belongs to uh, an association uh, called uh, Accorsois Senegal, where we try to gather a uh, choir um, in the in the in the fields of um, uh, choral area, just to promote choral activities um, out of the churches and in the society, in the community, in the uh, schools and the university. Wow, that's so exciting. And I, I cannot wait to know a little bit more because it's so different than uh, what we're familiar with. And it sounds like you're just doing so much bringing people together, not just in the choral art form as well, in all art forms. So it's quite exciting. And Lucien, thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to picking your brains and asking you more questions about your choral community. Thank you. So of course, in order to uh, have a strong, vibrant choral community, we need to look into how is choral education um, fostered, especially for a younger generation? How is that introduced for children, for youth? So for this next part, I want to ask all of you, um, how is it like? Uh, how is choral education like in a public school system or in daycare or in communities for children and youth in your choral community? Let's start with Colombia, Anna. Uh, how is it like in your, your side of the world? Well, uh, it's different, um, the choral community in Bogota, the capital, than in Colombia. Mm -hmm. uh, in Bogota, we have, uh, the district has a program in public schools uh, with children that they can see orchestra as well as choirs uh, from very young age. And they, we also have uh, several youth choirs, um, like also are part of the district or the district program. Uh, very important ones. So there are very, some few ones, very, very nice youth choirs. Um, um, one, the name is Canta Bogota Canta, um, which is also like from, mostly from public schools kids. And let me explain something about public schools in Colombia. We have private schools like everywhere and public schools, but public schools are uh, for people with very few income. Mm -hmm. um, so this program is for public schools, uh, private schools. Every school has their own choir. Uh, that's that's very regular. Uh, but but that that program for public schools are beautiful. Really, uh, they do an amazing work in there. And then these other chamber choirs or more or more, let's say like developed choirs, like Canta Bogota Canta or the, or the other one. Uh, that the name is Scola, uh, that it is from a Catholic church uh, mm -hmm. with children as well. That is beautiful work as well. So yeah, like for Great. children and youth, we are growing there very nicely. That's very exciting to hear. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, Yelena, what about you, uh, the Iceland? I know you have spent a lot of time in the different parts of the world, but in specifically Iceland, how is choir uh, infused into young children and youth's life? I would say, uh, generally speaking, so music education in, in Iceland is quite strong. I would say the strengths in choral education may become at a later age uh, for youth, uh, kind of from the age of 16 to 20. There are some very, very strong choirs in schools at that age, uh, as well as universities. But uh, in the younger levels, uh, singing is, a, is perhaps a little bit more informal. There are mm -hmm. many schools that will have a sort of uh, part of the singing together informally as part of the school program. So one elementary school in Reykjavik, for example, the capital, they start every single day by having all of the kids of the entire school sing together before they go off into their classes. So every grade. Yeah, all of the grades, they're all together in sort of the main big lobby and they just sing together and then they go off to their classes. Um, so of course, that's not a choir per se and they're not maybe learning technique or how to sing, but they're mm -hmm. just having this experience of singing together in an informal way. 
Uh, and that's fairly common in other schools as well. Other primary schools will do that maybe once a week or twice a week, well, where all of the children in the entire school just get together in the auditorium or whatever their largest space is, and they'll just sing together uh, songs that everyone knows, and it's a fairly informal type of thing. Uh, of course, there are schools that have choirs as well. That's not necessarily a mandatory part of the school system, but there are music classes just as there are in, in many countries. Um, that's part of the curriculum. And then there will be extracurricular choirs as well, both within schools and outside of schools. In terms of music education in general, uh, the way that it's structured in Iceland is that there are public or partially publicly funded music schools. So if you are a child and you want to take music lessons or, or your parents, you want to uh, put your kid in music lessons, you'll just go to your neighborhood music school and mm -hmm. you'll pay maybe a fee each semester for the lessons, but that fee is subsidized by the government. So you're not paying the full cost of the lessons. And this means that music education is more accessible and it's fairly common for children to learn some sort of instrument. Of course, there is still a cost involved and it's still not accessible to everybody. So um, it's definitely something that could be better, but I think it's something the government is quite aware of. The culture minister recently signed a, a bill that sort of ensures that all children in the entire country have access to music education. So it's definitely something that they want to keep improving. Uh, Iceland is very, there's a lot of variation when it comes to living in the capital of Reykjavik and living in the countryside. So that's definitely something to kind of be aware of in that sense, uh, because two thirds of the whole population, the very small population live in Reykjavik. Right. So yeah, just to get to give everybody a bit of context, the entire population of Iceland is about 360,000 people, that's it. <laughs> So, so <laughs> much less than the population of Hong Kong, for example. Yeah. <laughs> that's maybe like one neighborhood in Hong Kong, <laughs> not even. But uh, yeah, so that's the whole population. And about two thirds live in Reykjavik or the that's capital right, area. The capital. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a lot more kind of services and educational programs here than there are in very small communities out in the countryside and in other parts of the country. So if you live in a community with maybe 100 people, uh, there is probably not going to be a choir in your school because, or not a formal you choir, because maybe yeah. your school has 10 students. <laughs> but there will be you know, some sort of informal singing, probably. And of course, uh, church choirs are, are just very popular all around the country and just all kinds of community choirs. So choirs are definitely something that uh, people or children grow up seeing and hearing in their communities, mm -hmm. I would say. I, I think that's just so powerful. I had, you know, goosebumps just knowing that everyone come together and introduced to singing and using their voices, even in an informal way. Uh, but having that chance of just getting to know their own instruments, their built in instruments, right? I think it's so important and so lovely. And the fact that your government is subsidizing music lessons and encouraging music lessons that that is such an exciting thing to hear as well um i find it very interesting because as an immigrant coming to canada uh, my first realization of music education was very much instrument based um i, I yelena you grew up in canada you will know what i mean but a lot of our classes are band classes or guitar classes or ukulele classes um and we're starting to find that students don't use their voices as much, uh, especially in the public school system. Um, now in Hong Kong though, however, where I grew up is the music classes or general music classes. We were introduced to more things, um, history, theory, and everyone was introduced to SOFEG from what I remember. Leon, is that still the case? Um, everyone can still do SOFA, uh, but of course it is a very competitive driven as Leon introduced in the beginning part of his introduction. Um, there's a lot of formalized choir in Hong Kong um, and it's very competitive driven. But in terms of the general music class, um, are, are they singing a lot? Are they using their voices a lot still? Yeah, actually, in 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 Hong Kong, uh, maybe it, I think in, in 
most of Hong Kong people's memory, what, what they do during music lesson when, when they were students is singing, just keep singing. But the teacher just don't care how, how good or how bad you, 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 you sing. And for the, at the end of, of the terms, you got to do examination. Okay, singing, just sing, come and sing and then give you, give you a mask. But actually the teacher never care or never teach you how, how to sing. Actually, it's quite, I, I find it's, it's really interesting that music as a subject within the regular curriculum is always being ignored in, in Hong Kong. However, in many schools, especially those elite schools, they, 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 they may invest lots of resources in their music groups or instrumental classes as extracurricular activities. As I mentioned, there are, there are lots of great school choirs in Hong Kong and they have excellent results in different international competitions. But and somehow in many schools, um, choir, the, the, the existence of, of choir is just like an alternative sports team. The purpose mm -hmm. is to fight for the glory to this, for, for the schools. Of course, there are, are schools organized choir for their students just to enrich their life. And, and actually, I, I, I'm teaching one secondary school choir and one primary school choir. And the music teachers and the principal also told me, uh, don't care about competition. It's just a aim for, for them, a, 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 a stage for them to perform. You, you don't need to care about the result. I just want, I just want them to enjoy music, and that's just a goal. Uh, um, yeah, we, 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 and and I enjoy in, in to teach choir in in such environments. But you know, in some schools, they 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 when when they train their choir, their aim is to win. No, mm -hmm. if you got second, you are still lost. You right. gotta be the champion. <laughs> Well, it is, um, it is nice to hear that there is a, a shift, especially in the school, thinking that, you know, choir doesn't have to be competition. It can be an extracurricular activity that, it, that simply enrich a student's life and come and sing uh, and not just for a competition. So maybe this is something that is slowly shifting and hopefully it will con continue to shift. And so, speaking of shifting too, I think that shifts to in Africa, from what we see here in the west, in the in, in the western part of the world, in the, or in Canada, is you know there's always so much joy, um, seeing an African choir singing. Is is that something that is very much embedded in a childhood childhood or a children education or just an overall daily life? So, how is it like in Louisiana? I think we're having a different side of the world. That's very interesting to see. Yes, yes, uh, choral singing is very active here. Uh, like in most African uh, cultures, you can um, see that uh, everyone, everyone sing, and everyone sing always. <laughs> so choral singing, uh, and despite the fact that choral singing activity has a, a connotation, a religious one, and uh, people um, think that uh, in Senegal, uh, traditionally, uh, choral singing is um, something, a subject for Christian. Mm -hmm. oh. And as a Christian are only 10% of the population, so you can imagine the, the, the area. And second thing, that um, there is a division of trades here in Senegal um, in our tradition. And you can um, see that uh, only uh, the people called griots, the griots, um, is, is a case that um, is allowed to sing in certain ethnic tradition. So singers can be Despite of this, uh, singers can be children or adults or, or youth uh, or seniors. And um, we have a religious choir, we have university choir, we have a, um, most of a community choir and then children choirs, multicultural choirs. But we are noting that uh, now many young Christian, Christians who engage, uh, who are engaging in musical career uh, in gospel, uh, but there is no competition or um, festival not, not only just one festival, choral festival, international one I organized, and awards, the awards um, by uh, each every year. Um, but on the edu educational uh, side, um, you can see that there's only one hour in the, um, in the program of uh, secondary uh, schools, uh, one hour of music courses by week. 
only one hour and they talk about uh, history theory and there's not uh, um, many instruments just to to practice to, to to do music and we can see that there's no choral activity in schools no institute or university uh, dedicated uh, for music school for uh, choral music there's no graduated singing teachers to learn vocal technique <laughs> no music school with academic courses or um, uh, on conducting or choral department in senegal uh, so there's, there's a difference between collective singing culture and the choral singing uh, mm -hmm. it's a matter of perception and in people's mind um, collective singing is uh, just sharing uh, living heritage and it's considered at uh, considered as a vector of a social uh, bond there's a it's a spontaneous is a simple natural oral practice and uh, choral singing is uh, considered as a vector of uh, excellence so we have a written tradition we have a, of music scores uh, rules organized by voices and conductor uh, presence um, so for singers uh, people consider that uh, singing is quite natural so they don't need to, to learn how, how to sing. And uh, they just want to sing for pleasure and not to become professional. Because when you sing um, uh, just in a choir or other, you can maybe, uh, it's a way maybe to reach a professional career. And for conductors, there's no professional opportunities for them. So they, they don't see the, the need to, to learn how to conduct. My, mm -hmm. um, despite uh, in my federation, I am trying to organize a session, uh, mu music uh, courses uh, with Accorjoa International and um, uh, Conductors Without Border, a program of IFCM, International Federation for Choral Singing, and a three years uh, cycle with uh, two uh, sessions by a year. And uh, now we have three conductors who are graduate by this session and there's a um, there's a just one school uh Ecole Nationale des Arts a school of uh, music um uh, you have uh, four years uh, to learn uh, instruments but no um, no faculty for choral singings so we had a chance to hear how um choir and music education and singing is fostered for children and youth. And I want to bring us to the other side of the coin is uh, professional choirs. So here in Canada, we're interested to hear a little bit about uh, what would one do if they want to be a professional chorister? Uh, are there any professional choir? Uh, in North America and Canada, there are quite a lot of professional choirs in the sense that uh, each singers get paid and uh, is also quite common in certain churches that will have singer leads. So choir leads that are paid singers and then they ended up uh, grouping together as a chamber ensemble. So that's also a professional choir in that sense. Um, so I wanted to try to go around the room a little bit uh, to get a sense of professional choirs in your country. and and go from there. So Anna, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Colombia? Are there any professional choirs? Well, we have one professional choir in Bogota, uh, uh, which is uh, the youth choir from the Philharmonic Orchestra. So it's the, the choir that sings mostly with, they have their own programs, like five to six concerts per year. And plus, they sing with the orchestra as well, with the Philharmonic mm -hmm. Orchestra. Um, that that choir is kind of a youth choir as well. Like they are, they are singers who just graduate from bachelors um, till 25, 26 years old. Like, like they and they don't get paid like to live with that, but they get paid during the whole year, and they have the contract and everything. And then, yeah. Professional choirs. <laughs> That's very helpful, Anna. Um, what about Lucien? Uh, in Senegal, uh, we have not reached <laughs> yet this level of professional choir uh, because uh, conductors are not professional, so <laughs> you can't can't find <laughs> conductor um, singers, professional singers too. So, but we are trying to um, to, to explain to the Ministry of um, of Youth that they have to introduce it would be better to introduce um, the choral activities in their policy for youth in Senegal, just to um, uh, to be uh, rooted in our 
culture and try to reach the world because we are talking about um, uh, global go globalization. And with the Ministry of um, of Education, we are trying to explain. We're trying to set a collaboration just to introduce uh, uh, choral activities in the program uh, since the uh, primary school um, with the secondary school and maybe to develop um, uh, careers for musical career for singers. Mm -hmm. That's, I, I really like hearing that from you, Lucien, I've learned so much uh, from you and your efficacy in, in the shift that is heading. And I'm excited to come back and continue to chat with you within the next 10 years. I feel like you guys are just making making changes every day and you yourself is such a big advocate behind that too. So it's really exciting to see. So thanks for that. Um, Yelena, uh, professional choirs in Iceland, how is it like? So I would say there are maybe one or two professional, fully professional choirs where the conductor and the singers get paid. And I would say they're mostly project based. Uh, one would be Skola Kantorum, which is associated with the largest church in downtown Reykjavik. And they've recorded several professional albums uh, and they do concerts and they'll get hired for private events as well. So that's one choir where I know the singers get paid at least for some of the projects that they do. Uh, then the opera company, the Icelandic Opera Company has a chorus as well, which I believe is just project-based where they would be hired for opera productions that involve a chorus. Um, so of course they get paid for their work there. But otherwise I would say just mostly because the population is so small to be a, a professional choral singer where you make a living just via choral singing would be pretty much impossible just because it's so small. Um, on the other hand, I would say there are a lot of choirs that are semi-professional and that manage to definitely pay their conductors thanks to grants. There's quite a good grant system for the arts and music in Iceland, um, at least in my experience as compared to, for example, Canada. This is maybe one thing where the, the small population is an advantage. There's a fair amount of funding for the arts and then because the population is smaller, maybe there's a little bit less competition, or at least mm -hmm. that's how it, it feels to me. Maybe that's just my perspective. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I find yeah. that with us too, with the grants, is it depends on the province. Um, mm -hmm. And certain provinces that might have more choirs, it obviously is a lot more competitive and, um, and it depends on the funding too. But that's interesting to hear for the semi-professional groups. Yeah. And their yeah. conductor will be paid and the and in a project based kind of situation too. Right? Yeah, I mean, I can say, for example, for my choir, we've applied for several grants where we'll be planning a certain project. For example, we planned a festival where we would premiere a bunch of new Icelandic music written by the members. And so uh, in applying for the grant, we applied for a certain salary for myself, the conductor, as well as other costs uh, to, for example, commission the pieces. So grants are one way that uh, conductors at least will get paid in community groups and, and semi-professional groups. Um, then most community choirs will charge a small membership fee to their members. And then that money sometimes goes toward paying the conductor, sometimes goes toward whatever costs the choir itself might have with concerts and that sort of thing. Of course, concerts themselves could be a, a potential fundraising thing. Uh, and yeah, there's just different different methods uh, for mm -hmm. kind of keeping the the music making moving forward, uh, I suppose. But yeah, oh. I would be interested to know also what it's like in in other countries, um, in your countries, in terms of those choirs that are maybe semi professional, though they're not fully professional, where every single member gets paid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Anna. <laughs> Mm, yeah, in Colombia, we do have semi-professional choirs and uh, project-based choirs as well. Like we have uh, a choir that uh, mostly sings for opera pro uh, projects and another choir that sings for orche like symphonic, choral symphonic or, uh, projects. And then uh, we have two youth choirs that the uh, community choirs for children that the conductor get paid as well. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's uh, good to know. What about uh, in Hong Kong there, Leon? <clears throat> uh, 
Please, 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 please,
different times of your day. It is currently uh, close to 1 a.m. in Hong Kong and 4 p.m. in Iceland and Senegal and uh, 11 a.m. for Colombia and Toronto. Um, so it's been a great time just trying to connect with you all. So thank you. We look forward to seeing you in the second episode. <laughs> Bye. Bye.